Well, good morning to everybody. Good morning. I hope you're all doing well. We want to welcome you to New Hope. And uh, before we get into our message this morning, would you just bow with me and uh, pray, please? Father, we are thankful for uh, the privilege of being able to worship you this morning, Lord. Just being able to come before your throne and, uh, and sing praises to you, Lord. What a privilege that is, Father. And we don't, we don't want to take that life or take that for granted. And so, Father, we just praise you for that. Father, we also praise you for the country in which we live, the fact that we have the freedom to worship you without persecution, without fear of death or physical pain, Lord, because we know so many around the world are experiencing just that because of their love for you. Men and women being dragged off to jail, beaten, tortured, and even killed for your name's sake. Father, we lift them up before you this morning. We ask that you would protect them, that you would strengthen them and embolden them even more, Father. Continue to give them courage to stand for you and for truth. And Father, we do thank you for those who serve our country, who keep us free, who keep us safe. Father, those who uh, those who protect our families, the firemen, the, the police the military. Father, we just lift them and their families up to you. Know, we, we are so mindful of them and of their sacrifice. We ask that you protect them, that you watch over them, that you provide for them. And we thank you for them. And Father, now as we prepare to open your word, Lord, we do so humbly, and we do so reverently, knowing, Father, that, uh, that this is your word, not ours. And so we ask that you, uh, as, as we open your word, you would guide us. Your word is our textbook. Your Holy Spirit is our instructor. And Lord, we stand on equal footing before you this morning as we, as we plumb the depths of your word. And so we ask that you would reveal to us your truth. And even more than that, Father, we ask that you would help us to apply these truths to our lives in a way that would change us. In a way that would help us to walk out of this place different this morning than when we came in. And we ask all these things in your name for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know the resurrection of Jesus? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. My mic. Is that better? Yeah. All right. My wife never, ever tells me to be louder. That's weird. Wow. Okay, so... The resurrection of Jesus is the central event upon which all of Christianity hinges. And you know, we live in a world today that questions much of Christianity, questions whether even God exists sometimes. But certainly, even those who don't question whether God exists, some of them question, you know, is Jesus really who he said he was? Did he really live? Did he really die? Was he really buried in a tomb? And most importantly, was he really resurrected? Just, just give me a sign, we say. Just give me a sign, people often think. You know, just let me know you're real somehow. Let me know you are who you say you are. Just give me a sign. A sign. And it is interesting that people ask this because we find ourselves in a situation in which truly we have to admit that if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not true, <laughs> we're fools. We really are. And all that we're doing here and all this singing and all this stuff, this is, this is a waste of time. Let, let's go home and sleep in on Sunday morning. Could, could we do that, you know? Because if Jesus Christ is not resurrected, then we are fools, truly. And we admit that readily this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16, the Apostle Paul himself says this, catch this. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if, Christ, if in Christ we have hope only in this life, then we are of all people most to be pitied. And you know, the fact is there are many people out there who really do pity Christians. Some of them pity us, and the other half hate us. 
But everything hinges on the central event of Jesus' resurrection. And so it's interesting to find that people will want to look for a sign, will want to seek after a sign. After all, if we are to place our hope and our trust in the Bible as being the Word of God and in Jesus Christ as being our Savior, shouldn't we, don't we deserve something? Don't we deserve some information? Don't we deserve some proof, some evidence, some kind of a sign? Just show me a sign. And it's a good question. Did he really exist? Did he really come back to life? The resurrection matters because Jesus said he would be raised from the dead. And if he wasn't, then we can't trust anything else that he says. So the stakes are high, make no mistake. The stakes are high and everything hinges on this one issue alone. Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Now our primary text this morning is Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. And it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees... Now, by the way, let me give you just a little bit of background on this. The scribes and Pharisees had just seen Jesus cast out demons out of somebody. Okay? He was completely cured, completely healed. They saw this. They witnessed it. And in fact, it was so real, and they knew that what, what had happened was a miracle to the extent that the Pharisees even said, hey, you know what? He's doing this by the power of Satan. By Beelzebul, he's doing this. That's how he's doing it. He's casting out Satan by the power of Satan. So they knew it was real. Now, here's the funny thing. Catch this. So here's Jesus. He, he casts out these demons, right? And now the very next word out of the Pharisees' mouths after they accuse him of, of, of doing this by the power of Satan, catch this, catch the next thing they said. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Really? You, you, but what was, I mean, I just, didn't you catch that? I, <laughs> I just cast out a demon. And he says, look, I, I, we, I, we want to see a sign from you. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to his answer. He answered them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's Jesus saying? What's the point here? Here's the point. The point is Jesus saying, is saying, look, you guys are seeking after some kind of a miraculous sign. You want some proof? You want some evidence? Okay, fine, cool. I'll give it to you. But it's not going to come like you think it's going to come. I'm not going to pull a rabbit out of my hat. I'm not going to do a magic trick right here before your eyes. What I'm going to do is I'll be put to death and I'll be resurrected three days later. Why did Jesus say, say this to them? After all, what's wrong with seeking a sign, right? Like, what's, what's wrong with these people uh, seeking a sign? What's the big deal? Why is Jesus so upset about this? And I'll tell you why. Here's why Jesus is so upset. Because Jesus understands one truth. And that is that them seeing a sign is going to make absolutely no difference in their faith. Amen. Now, how does he know this? Where does he get this information from? Seth, could you pass to the next slide? Here's where he gets this information from. Matthew 11, this is just a chapter before. Catch this. Matthew 11, 21 says this. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Why? Here's why. For if the mighty works, that means all the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. These wicked cities, Tyre and Sidon, some of the most wicked cities that ever existed. And he says, look, if they had seen what you are seeing, they would have repented long ago. Because Jesus did miracles in front of them already. But it's not enough. See, it's always more. Always give us a little bit more. Another sign. Another thing. Give me another proof. That's not enough. And if you don't believe that's true about people like this, you try speaking to someone who does not believe in God and they will give you a reason. They will say, well, I don't believe in God because 
A, B, C. And you reason with them from a scientific standpoint, from the standpoint of history, from the standpoint of archaeology. You reason with them and you completely dispel all of their stated reasons for why they don't believe in God. And guess what they will do? They believe. No. No. They come up with another reason. And another reason. And another reason. And another reason. Give us another sign. Give us more proof. Give us some more evidence. It's never enough. And so Jesus says, look. No signs. No more signs. Enough signs. I'll give you one sign. And that'll be my resurrection from the dead. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That'll be your sign. Now it's interesting. There's a medical doctor by the name of Vern Palmasano. Uh, Dr. Palmasano travels the country teaching lecturing on the subject of the proof, not only of Jesus' existence and death and burial, but also of his resurrection from a historical perspective, you see. And in a recent interview with Dr. Paul Masano, he said these words, catch this. The question dividing the world, the question dividing the world is not whether God is real. Most people believe that but rather whether Jesus is who he says he was and whether he was crucified, died, and then bodily raised from the dead in the flesh. See, that's the whole ball of wax. That's the whole question. Why? Here's why. Because, folks, if he actually did die and was resurrected like he said he was, then every single word out of his mouth can be trusted. Everything he said every claim he made about himself. And if he didn't actually raise from the dead, then we must completely dismiss every statement he made about himself. Now, if you are unaware, archaeological discoveries continue to come forth every week or month that continue to support the history, historicity of the Bible. And there is a magazine called Biblical Archaeological Review. If you don't have it, I suggest you subscribe to it, Biblical Archaeological Review. It's a magazine that simply speaks of all the archaeological findings around the world that clearly prove the truth, the historicity, the validity, the veracity of Scripture. Now, historical evidence for Jesus' existence comes not just from the Bible, See, there's many out there who say, well, you know, maybe Jesus never even existed. Maybe these Bible guys just made it up. You know, they kind of got together, big conspiracy. Hey, let's agree on something. Let's make up a religion. Well, the fact is, the evidence for Jesus' existence comes from many other writings outside of the Bible. Many other well-known and respected historians outside of the Bible. Thallius, uh, Julius Africanus, Maribar Sarfrin, Flagian, Suetonius, uh, Celsus, Flavius, Josephus, Cornelius, Tacitus, Lucian of Samosata, and the Sanhedrin, and many, many others speak of not only Jesus' life, but his death, and also the eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Now, in addition to the historical evidence for his existence and crucifixion and the eyewitnesses to his resurrection, there are many scientific evidences for the there may be scientific uh, uh, evidence for the resurrection as well. Now, I want to just present to you very quickly this morning one possible, I, I say that again, possible, possible scientific proof for the resurrection of Jesus. And I've spoken on this before and I've shared this with you some time ago, but I feel it's apropos in this situation. The Shroud of Turin you may have heard of this. The Shroud of Turin is a linen cloth which is 14 feet long by 3 feet wide that purports to be the burial cloth of Jesus himself. Now, while many evangelicals are silent about this cloth because they don't want to claim that this is the thing, just like I don't, and I respect that, nonetheless, it demands that we at least examine some of the evidence. 
Dr. G. D. James Kennedy once remarked when he first heard about the Shroud, he said, quote, I confess that when I first heard about the so-called Shroud of Turin, my attitude was one of great skepticism. I have never been impressed with any relics, but it should be required of every honest person to at least have an open mind and examine the evidence. Christianity is based upon evidence after all. What does the evidence say? And of course, as Dr. Kennedy began to study the evidence, he became convinced himself that the shroud really was the burial cloth of Jesus. Now, we're not saying this morning that it absolutely is, but I just want to share some thoughts with you. One of the great experts on the shroud in our day is Dr. Alan Wanger, a retired professor from Duke University. Duke Medical Center, uh, who has spent his life studying not only medicine, but since the 70s has spent his life studying the Shroud of Turin. There are, in fact, over 67 different fields of scientific and academic interest that have looked at the Shroud and studied it in one way or another. And there's been an enormous amount of research done on it from every angle. And he says, it is our conviction that the Shroud is indeed the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth, and we feel we can date it to the spring of 30 AD in the Middle East, and that we see on the shroud the various wounds. What we see on the shroud with his various wounds is entirely consistent with the scriptural account of the crucifixion of Jesus. One man's opinion. But consider the following details about the shroud yourself. One, the human anatomy that is represented on the shroud is 100% correct to all known medical science today. Now, knowledge about anatomy in recent years wasn't that great. And those that claim it was created in the 14th century as a hoax have a problem because the things that are, that are depicted on this shroud were not medically known until the 20th century. 14th century knowledge of anatomy was extremely limited. If the, cloth, if the cloth were a work of any kind of medieval forger, then he knew things that was not known to medical science until centuries later. Secondly, for the first time ever, the shroud was actually photographed on a film camera in 1898. It was discovered when it was photographed, that there was something unique about this that they had never known until it was photographed. Now, for those of you who are maybe younger than 20 or 25, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But back in the day, you know, you used to put film in cameras, you know, and, and you take that thing, you know, and you, you wind up the film and you put it in there and, and it's done, you know, you take your 32 pictures and you pull it out of there and you walk down to your thrifty, you know, and you pay them five bucks and they, process the thing, and they give you back not only these cool little pictures, they're actually on paper, wow, imagine that, right, not on a screen, but they give you these pictures on paper, and then they actually give you, inside the thing, they give you this thing called a negative. I don't know if you've ever seen that, they're called negatives. They're just this little film strip, and what it is, is a negative is just what you think, it's negative, it's the exact opposite of what the picture actually is, so light is dark, and dark is light. Now, when they took a photograph of the Shroud of Turin in 1898, it was discovered that the actual shroud itself is a negative. It is a photographic negative. Hundreds of years before photography was ever invented, the faint image on the shroud was not painted on. Everyone agrees on this, even the skeptics, even the critics. It was, there's no paint involved. It was only lightly burned on. It's as if at the moment of Christ's resurrection, there was a burst of radiation that created uh, possibly this image. It's done through some sort of scorching process, yet it's only lightly scorched. It's five one thousandths of an inch thick and does not contain any pigment. Next, the blood on the shroud is confirmed to be actual human blood. With the wounds, now here's the interesting thing, the wounds not only correspond to Jesus scourging, but here's where it gets real weird. If you look at all of the paintings, and I mean all of them, from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century about Jesus, they all have the nail prints in his hands. 
right here, right in the palms, all of them. That's what all the artists depict, every single one of them. The Shroud of Turin has the nail prints in the wrist. Now, it has been discovered, not only uh, from history, but from anatomy, you can't crucify a man hanging him by his palms. It'll rip right out. You've got to do it by the wrists. And by the way, that's exactly the way the Romans did it. Unknown till that time. How do you make that a forgery? Next, the image on the shroud is three-dimensional. When ordinary photographs or paintings are studied through a highly advanced machine at NASA called a VP8 image analyzer, there's something that happens to the images. The images always become distorted. However, the shroud has been proven to be a completely undistorted three-dimensional image containing three-dimensional properties. It could not have been a painting. Now, even the skeptics that study the Shroud of Turin agree that this is a mystery as to how it was created, that it's not explained away easily. They say, if it is a hoax, it is no ordinary hoax. And of course, the greater evidence argues for its possible authenticity. As some scientists put it, the Shroud is, if you will, a, quote, snapshot of the resurrection. As such, the Shroud of Turin may prove to be scientific evidence for the resurrection. Now, again, we're not saying that this morning. We're just saying it's possible. Just something to think about. Here's an image of the negative that is produced by this, this shroud. But we need to say one thing this morning, and that is if the shroud is absolutely a hoax, let's just say for a moment, moment it is, we're on very good ground we're not on shaky footing about the evidence for Jesus' resurrection because the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so, so clear and so abundant. Renowned scholars such as William L. Craig, J.P. Moreland, Harry ha uh, Gary Habermas and others have detailed all this evidence and I, I encourage you to study it on your own. I can't in a sermon present you uh, with all the evidence. But I want to just do a little bit of justice to this, maybe if I could this morning. First, I want to explore with you why is it that there are some historians that say, you know, it's possible Jesus never even, res even existed, let alone resurrected. Why do many historians deny the resurrection of Jesus as a historical fact, or sometimes even the existence of Jesus? Well, first... <laughs> There is bias out there. Can you believe there's bias in the scientific community? No one would ever think that, right? See, they deny the historicity of the resurrection, not for academic reasons, but for personal philosophical reasons. And I'll show you how they do this. There's a quote by Dr. William Craig, and, and I'll just quote him rather than trying to paraphrase. Listen to this. Dr. William Craig says, quote, the philosophical argument used most often today to disprove the resurrection is an old argument against the identity of miracle, identification of miracles, which I had studied during my doctoral research and which is regarded by most philosophers today as demonstrably fallacious. In other words, he's saying they're using reasoning that is completely nonsense. In fact, it's circular reasoning. And it goes something like this. Here's what the reasoning goes like, okay? Because we do not believe in miracles, we know there's no such thing as miracles. Therefore, any historical eyewitness reports of miracles taking place must therefore be false. Isn't that convenient? Isn't that work great? It's like, it's like, I know for a fact, and everybody knows, that there's no such thing as a Chevrolet. And so any evidence that you give me that there's one out there has got to be rejected. It's great, right? It's circular reasoning. Now I want to explain to you a method that modern historians today use to determine the historicity of an event. It's called inference to the best explanation. It's a process, it's a method. It's called inference to the best explanation. And, and here's what it means. 
Dr. William Craig describes this as an approach where we, quote, begin with the historical evidence available to us and then infer what would, if true, provide the best explanation for the existence of that evidence. In other words, we have some evidence, but what does it lead us to? What conclusion does it lead us to? For example, you drive up to your house at midnight, you see the door kicked open, and a guy in a ski mask running out with your TV. Now, you report this to the police, you make a statement, and then based on that statement, they will then make some assumptions. Now, it is a logical assumption to assume that the person in the house did kick the door down and that he was there for the purpose of stealing your television. Now, yes, it's true that can be argued, but it's kind of hard. And so what we do as historians, what historians do is they look at the evidence and they say, based on this evidence, what do we think actually historically happened? What historical event took place on the basis of this evidence? It's real simple. It's called inference to the best explanation. Now, when we apply this method to determining the historical account of the evidence that is given for the truth of the resurrection, it emerges that it is the best historical explanation for what actually happened. Professor Simon Greenleaf, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy, he is one of the principal founders of Harvard Law School. Hopefully you've heard of Harvard Law School. This guy is one of the founders of Harvard Law School, okay? Greenleaf's principal work of legal scholarship was something called the Treatise on Law and Evidence, okay? So he basically wrote the definitive work on how we establish law based on evidence, how we judge things, how we judge cases based on evidence. I want you to listen to his words. This is a quote from Professor Simon Greenleaf, quote, the historical evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is more convincing than the evidence for the existence of any Caesar, any Pharaoh, or any ancient king who ever lived. It's worth noting that you don't need, by the way, to believe the Bible to establish the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. You could take the Bible, completely dispense with it, and simply on the basis of historical accounts prove that Jesus is claimed to have been raised from the dead by many eyewitnesses. There are a few facts, very few, but there are a few facts that virtually all scholars that deal with this agree on. I don't care how liberal you are. I don't care how... Uh, uh, how uh, how, how much you want to try to deny this, there, there's a few facts that all scholars, regardless of how skeptical, will agree on. And I just want to share four facts with you very briefly and then we'll close. Four facts about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that all scholars, even the liberal ones, agree on. Fact one. After his resurrection, Jesus was buried by Joseph, or, or after his crucifixion, Joseph, uh, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. I'll say it again. After Jesus of Nazareth's crucifixion, he was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. Historians have established this fact on the basis of evidence, such as the following. One, Jesus' burial is multiply attested in early independent historical documents. Four biographies of Jesus and a number of letters in addition to source material which dates to within seven years of the crucifixion states this. Paul, of course, uh, cites an extremely early source for Jesus' burial, which most scholars date to within five years of Jesus' crucifixion. Independent testimony to Jesus' burial by Joseph is also found in the sources behind Matthew, Luke, and the Gospel of John, not to mention the extra-biblical Gospel of Peter. 
And so we have a remarkable number of at least five independent sources for Jesus' burial, some of which are very early. Second, as a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is very unlikely to be a Christian invention. There was an understandable hostility in the early church toward Jewish leaders. In Christian eyes, of course, they had engineered the judicial murder of Jesus. And so according to the New Testament scholar Raymond Brown, Jesus' burial by Joseph is very probable since it is, quote, almost inexplicable by any other means. Why would Christians make up a story about a Jewish Sanhedrist who does the right thing? For those and other reasons, most New Testament critics concur that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. According to Professor John A. T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in a tomb is, quote, one of the earliest and best attested facts in history. Fact number two that everyone agrees on. On the Sunday, on the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty. It's a historical fact. And I will not go into all the reasons that the scholars give, though I have several here, but for time we'll pass on to the next one. By the way, just as a side note, the Jews thought that uh, the Christians might form a plot to get Jesus out of the tomb. And so they asked the Romans to set guard in front of this tomb. They did, they placed guards in front of the tomb. And by the way, if you didn't know under Roman law, if you were guarding anything, if you were guarding anything, and you failed in your mission, there was only one disciplinary act that took place, and that was death. I'm thinking those guards are awake. Something happened there. Fact three on which all scholars agree on different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people witnessed Jesus as being bodily raised from the dead. They all agree that we have multiple eyewitness attestation to that. And again, I won't bother you with all the details. And fourthly, the original disciples, and here's where it gets weird. The original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Now, someone says long about this time, someone comes along and says, look, it's real simple. These guys had a plot. They just said, they just got together one day and said, you know what, let, let's, let, 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 let's just say he resurrected. You know? After all, it'll look, it'll put us in a position of power, you know. We'll have some influence with people. People will come to us for the answers. We just made a wonderful new religion. That's how this whole thing went down. But then there's a problem. Why would these very people, I'm not talking generations later, I'm talking about the very same people themselves who claim that they saw Jesus raised. Why would they go to their deaths for that? You see, if I'm, if I'm making this thing up, if I'm, if I'm just creating a religion, you know, I want to be the guru, I'm going to play along with this game until they, you know, kind of start pulling my fingernails out or something. And then I'm like, hey, it's cool. Never mind. I made it all up, right? See, these guys not only suffered and were chased all around. They were fed to lions. They were crucified upside down. They were burned. They were tortured. They were... And all, folks, all they had to do is say, okay, okay, I made it up and they'd go free. See, a man does not die for what he does not believe is true. The best explanation of these facts and others 
is that Jesus did raise from the grave. Dr. William Craig says this statement, apart from the prejudice against miracles, there is no good reason for denying the historical core of the historical narratives. Compared to the sources for any Greco-Roman history, the Gospels stand head and shoulders above Greco-Roman historians what they had to work with, which is usually hundreds of years after the event they recorded, usually involve very few eyewitnesses and are usually told by people that are completely biased. And yet, Greco-Roman historians construct the course of history of the ancient world based on these dubious accounts. We accept them, but we reject the resurrection of Jesus. How so? See, in the end, in the end, I'm convinced of this. In the end, it is not about having all the right information. Oh, I'm all for gaining apologetic knowledge and historical knowledge and scientific knowledge and, and bringing that to bear. I think it is very effective. But in the end, it ultimately comes down to if you don't want to believe, you're not going to believe. No matter how much evidence. No matter how much you say, give me a sign. And Jesus says, I'm not going to give you any sign besides my resurrection. One last quote from Dr. N.T. Wright. He says this, quote, the empty tomb and the appearance of Jesus are just as certain as the death of Caesar Augustus in AD 14 or the fall of Rome in AD 70. Mm. Amazing. And Acts chapter 1 verse 3 tells us this. He presented himself alive to them after his appearing by many proofs. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. One final thought. Thomas. You've heard of Thomas? Doubting Thomas, right? We call him. You know this guy. I can relate to this guy. You know that in some ways? I can relate to this guy. I mean, look, the guy's a skeptic. I'm a skeptic, too, in many ways. You know, I, I just, I, I just kind of want some proof. Just give me some evidence. Just, just something. And John chapter 20, verse 24 says this, 24 and following. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hand, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it at my side here. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. <laughs> Catch this. And Jesus said to him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. If you're here this morning and for some reason, whatever the reason is, you, you don't believe. You haven't believed yet. You haven't taken that step, that, that, that last final step that says, you know what, I, I really do. I, I really believe he is who he says he is. And more than that, I want to make him my Lord. If you haven't done that yet, I want to encourage you with one passage. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. See, that's the promise Jesus is making for you. And he's making that promise on the basis of his resurrection. 
You say, show me a sign. Just give me a sign. He gave you one. And it's a beautiful sign. The question is, the question is, what will you do with the evidence? And how does it apply to you today? You see, this morning he is risen. It's not just a fairy tale. It's not just words on a page. It's not just a fable. It's not just a story. It's not just some convenient religion that somebody made up. It's true. It's documented. The evidence is there. The question is, what will you do with it? And if you're here this morning and you've been thinking through this process, you've been thinking, you know, is, is Jesus really raised from the dead? Did he really walk out of that tomb? Then may I encourage you this morning to consider that in a way you never have before. Ask the Lord to reveal himself to you. And if you're ready to make that decision, then you can make a a simple request from the Lord. You can ask Him to save you. You can ask Him to be your Lord. And you can do it by praying a prayer something like this. Lord, I know You're real. I know that You created the heavens and the earth. And Father, I know You sent Your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, to suffer, to bleed, to die be buried and to be raised again. Lord, I believe this morning that he was raised again. I believe there is a resurrection for me because of his resurrection. And Father, this morning, Lord, I confess to you my sin. I lay before you, Lord, all my guilt. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord as my God, as my Savior. I ask you to forgive all of my sins through his blood and his finished work on the cross. And I thank you for his resurrection this morning. And I thank you that through him, you make me your son, you make me your daughter. You've given me new life and new hope. 
In Jesus' name, amen.